Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, timeless investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe to follow along. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, here today with the number one value investing podcast in the world, sitting next to my co-host, my partner, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How is it going with you? It's going well. We hope it's going great for everybody else. Hey, if this is the first time that you're tuning in with us, check out all of our work. 160 plus different podcasts. A lot of people like that. It's shorter format, usually 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, you could search through a bunch of different topics. We've been doing this for over, like what, probably two years now, I think we're coming up on. Um, two years. Uh, two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could definitely sift through all those uh, podcasts. Uh, check out our YouTube, Focus Compounding on YouTube. We are trying a bunch of different interactive um, style of videos. We may start doing more vlog type stuff. Jeff and I have been doing a ton of scuttlebutt. Um, so I was thinking, why don't we film this? Now, we, we are fiduciaries. <laughs> we are fiduciaries, so we're probably not going to give a lot of information on what we're looking at, but we're going to try making it interactive as possible. Yeah. Why not get the content out there for the people? Um, and check out Twitter, my Twitter. That's probably the best place to get all the information on us, at Focus Compound. And if you like investing write-ups, Jeff's going to write up 250-plus write-ups this year on FocusCompounding.com. If you like to save money, use the podcast promo code, which is podcast. Uh, typically overlook stocks, lots of spinoffs, mostly written by Jeff. Also supplemented by other people, and then I uh, kind of just write about whatever once <laughs> once a once week. So that's yeah. my commitment. So uh, be sure to check out all of that as well. And like I said, use the podcast promo code if you're interested in that. So in today's podcast, we're going to be talking about liabilities, right. specifically debt. We're going to be talking about the liability side of the balance sheet. We're going to be going through um, and looking at a few different companies and really try to figure out how much is too much, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, obviously company debt is probably different. It is different than personal debt, mm -hmm. uh, like consumer debt. And, you know, I think, um, you know, we should go through the leverage process and, you know, what you typically look for when you analyze companies that have debt. Right. And because we're just going to look at financial debt today. I believe we're not doing leases. That's so, correct. So people understand that. Yeah. yeah. So we do have the screen up. As you can see, we are going to make this an interactive podcast. And mm -hmm. the first company we are going to be looking at, this is Entercom Communications, right. which is a stock that Trey... Henning Gurr talked about when he came on the podcast. It was a reverse Morris trust situation, special mm -hmm. situation. They spun off a company, and then that spinoff, I believe, acquired um, a bigger company. It was like a, a minnow swallowing a whale. Intercom bought CBS Radio. Yes, yes that's mm -hmm. what it was. And um, this company has debt. And I figured, yep. why not go through? We're on the sec.gov website. Okay. I don't like this interactive side of things. It's kind of annoying to me. Um, but here, we could go down to that. And their long-term debt is $1.7 And maybe, to, I guess, uh, before we jump into that, why don't we pull up their quick FS so I could go through. The market cap, $630 million, ticker ETM. And I don't need to really go through anything else. Uh, debt to equity, 1.6 times. Debt to assets, 0.5. But they have a $630 million market cap. And I think their enterprise value is like what? It's over $2 billion. So okay. lots of leverage. So uh, we know some things right away about it. Okay. So let's start with the liabilities. Now, interesting thing about this company is that they're listing all their liabilities together. Uh, let's see. They, oh, no. It's because of that confusing thing about the line. Yeah. So the, term, the long term debt is right under the total current liabilities. There's just no spacing here. Um, so long-term debt, what you would do is for debt purposes, you want to take that number, which was that 1.7 billion. I can't yep. see from yep. here. Yeah. And then you also want to add in, um, whatever, uh, current portion of the debt they have. And it doesn't seem like they have any current portion of that. They have a current portion and only of the lease mm -hmm. part of it. So that's the big thing is the, their debt, basically their, their financial debt's like what 1.7 uh, billion or something like that. It looks yeah. like they have some other liabilities, which we just won't worry about for right now. Um, they then let's look, go up on the balance sheet. So just move up to see the assets. So what cash they have? They only have about forty million cash. They don't have forty five million. Yep. Yeah. So um, investments. I don't know what that is, but probably not something they're going to sell for that. So I would assets held for sale is not a huge number either. So um, I would say that we'll just take the long term debt as it is of like one point seven billion. Mm -hmm. So let's go down and look at their um, income statement or their yeah income statement will work here. So operating income the last. 
So this is nine months. Yeah, day. we'll take the last nine months. So how much was operating income in the last nine months? A billion. Oh, operating income, uh, 174 million. 174 million, okay. And that's nine months, so we're going to assume that that will be mm, another 63 million or something added on to that, some, some number like that, because we're just going to assume there's no seasonality mm-hmm. to it. I'm sure there's some seasonality in radio, but whatever. So we'll just assume that's like 240 million, maybe 250 million. Um, in EBIT, just given mm-hmm. that as a number. And we just said it was, what, 1.7 yep. in terms of debt. So right there we have a number that's going to be, um, that will be, let's see, that's over, that's close to, it's basically seven times, mm-hmm. right, debt to EBIT. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is a company, a radio company, which may have a significant amount of depreciation and amortization. So what's the depreciation and amortization expense? It's uh, one of the top ones. 33 million. 33 million. So you could add that back, assume that it's not, um, that none of that is real stuff. A little bit of it is. And that would get you to like, you know, 200. Now they also have restructuring things, all that. I'm not seeing huge numbers for that. So maybe that's 200 million. So maybe, you know, you're 200 million, a little more than that in EBITDA. If you want to use EBITDA as the cash flow measure instead of EBIT, um, that's appropriate for a media company. So uh, we're still talking about something that is, you know, six times or something. I don't think I would like to see more than four times actual free cash flow normally. Um, I've said many times that almost any kind of business shouldn't have too hard a time borrowing like three times uh, debt to EBITDA probably. Like a stable business. This is a radio business. It's probably pretty stable. Um, I was going to say, does the type of business, I'm sure, you know, does it you know, change your judgment on how much debt they could take on and stuff? Yeah, it does. And I would say that radio historically would have a pretty good job of being able to do that. The one thing that I worry about me about it is obviously this is a terrestrial radio company. It might have problems in the future if this is a declining industry for any reason, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, what do you, do you want to look at? Like what type of debt it is? Is that important? I mean, yeah, I know so you always know look at the not mood. current stuff right now, to be honest at this level, it almost doesn't matter how long term the debt is. If the debt's all 30 year debt or something, that's fine. But other than that, this is too much debt for me for this stock. Mm-hmm. Um, now people can bet on it sort of like as if it's an option, you buy the common stock, like it's an option and size it accordingly. And I think stuff. you, you, t- we've talked about that before. If you were to actually, um, be involved in this company, you would try buying like long dated calls or something like that, like leaps. Yeah. So we can look at the f- cash flow statement because may- that, that might be more fair to the company here. So their cash flow statement though, but they have some messy parts to it, I'm sure, because of the um, restructuring because mm-hmm. of the stations they have. So what does it say has been produced by the operating f- cash flow from operations? Um, where Net we cash at, provided yeah. by used in operating activities. It's the bold line right above investing activities. Um, where's that? I can't even see it. Right I'm looking through this, through this thing right there. We go 104 million. Yeah, so it's even lower, right? And then they will have some capex and things like that. So this is just such low numbers of it. Now that's a nine month number, of course. Mm-hmm. So, um, but still, we're talking about less than 150 million. I'm sure there's all sorts of special charges and things. Yeah, I was gonna say if you look at this, cash charges, yeah. right? But there's still charges that they had to pay this year. To me, this is just a very low amount of cash flow generation versus debt. I mean, this at the rate they're doing it right now, it could take them 10 years to pay off all their debt. I don't mm-hmm. really like that. Um, of course, some radio station stuff keep debt all the time, but as I said, it's, that's sort of the the MO for a lot of radio companies. If you looked at iHeartRadio yeah. and stuff like that, they all had an enormous amount of debt. Yeah, I mean, they were in bankruptcy. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 radio yeah. station owners have been in bankruptcy. And by the way, I want to clarify, I know where cash flow from operating activities is, right? Okay. I got this big poll that Jeff and I are going to, we're going to buy a different stand because when I look at the computer, I'm like looking with one eye. I'm like, I can't see through this thing. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's all. So, yeah, um, so what about Moody? High risk. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So high risk. And then one thing that you typically do as well is you like to look at like the Moody's reports and stuff like that on the debt. You know, what's the rating on that? Right. Debt. So that's a good question to have. Um, so I would, for a company like this, look at Moody's S&P, Fitch, whatever ones there are, to Google. Two of the three are going to rate their debt probably. And to figure out um, what their ratings are on it and whether they've cut it, things like that. Mm-hmm. Also with bonds, you can sometimes find through various ways of what the bonds are trading at. And those could give you a hint about how people, what their attitude is about the common stock. Here, we know what the common stock has done, right? It's reacting kind of like there's a risk of insolvency at some point, right? Mm-hmm. It, it deteriorated a lot. You would think that if people were just buying it based on um, what they think it'll earn in the future, then this wouldn't be an issue. So even without looking at where your bonds are trading, uh, if this company has bonds rather than just uh, bank debt, um, I still would say that just based on their historical moves in this price, because this got down to like, oh, what? I mean, this stock has recovered a bit from the very Yeah, bottom. I think it was at like what? It started, I think, at like 14 or $15, and now it's okay. trading at So like, just as an example, the market cap right now is $600 million, according it's, to this. Yeah, $614 million, enterprise yeah. value $2.5 billion. And what, and what are the... Um, Let's see if we look at like what's their um, sales or whatever. There. Oh, you want to look at their sales? Yeah, sure. Um, um, there we go, right here. 
revenue, 1.4 billion in 2018. Right. So that's very unusual. So on like a leverage basis, it's incredibly low, which means people have some concerns about the debt probably. Mm-hmm. You could look at the stock um, chart. Now, a lot of people think it was, because remember that massive selling pressure was when, I mean, you see all that volume was when it happened, the special situation. Yeah. You know, CBS shareholders selling out and Trey talked about that. But I remember yeah. we looked at this. So I, I this is does not mean the stock is a bad stock to buy. It doesn't mean that it has too much debt. This is a distressed company, though. It's a what volatile freaking stock. It is volatile stock, too, yeah. But I'm just saying it is a distressed company looking at it from a financial perspective. Without looking at the stock price, I would tell you this is a distressed company in terms of the um, amount of debt they're carrying versus their ability to actually generate cash flow right now. Mm-hmm. It, it is distressed, and so you'd have to be someone who specializes in understanding credit-type situations to understand the stock. Got it. Next company we're going to be going over, talking about the balance sheet, America's Car Mart, Inc. Mm-hmm. You wrote this up for yeah, Singular Diligence. Website, yeah, uh, you can get a full report on this from mm-hmm. a few years back. Yeah, It is on the website. Um, let's see. So Since this is a finance-related company, I wanted to do something that has more, um, isn't just like debt loaded onto yeah. it. So the, the and this is the type Q I pulled up, by the way. Okay. So the, the intercom one is normally how people talk about debt. It's sort of like, here's a stock, it's a business, whatever, and it isn't using debt in its day-to-day business. What it's using is, um, it, CRM, and T, yeah, is, um, it's using this debt, uh, intercom as like financial debt to do a big acquisition or something, mm-hmm. right? And then you just think in terms of the enterprise value, that's traditionally people think about these things. But more often, you're going to have situations like America's Car Mart where they're regularly using leverage for some reason. Mm-hmm. And we can get into why they do that. Sure. So the business model for America's Car Mart is a little different from other kinds of um, subprime type car um, the companies that sell cars. So the company theoretically is in the business of selling cars. But in reality, what it's Keep going. Really Keep talking. in the Keep business going. of doing. Camera shut off. Keep okay. What? <laughs> but in reality, what it's really in the business of doing is making car loans, right? Now, the difference between America's Car Mart and a lot of other subprime and just uh, companies that make car loans in general is that uh, they aren't securitizing them. And there are reasons why they're not securitizing them, which is that the quality of the loans are so poor and that the uh, need to have pretty... Um, be very on top of it in terms of collections. The people that have to be very local to you to do this, you have to respond very quickly as soon as they miss a payment to contact them, things like that. Make it hard um, to securitize. Mm-hmm. So because they're not securitizing these loans, they will need to come up with some liabilities to uh, get returns similar to what other um, companies do by basically originating loans, then securitizing them and getting them off the balance sheet. Instead, America's Car is keeping them on the balance sheet. And to do that, they need to have some sort of uh, financing of it, mm-hmm. financing themselves. So let's talk about that, about their debt. So do you see the debt facilities? Uh-huh. And look at this really quick. Mezzanine equity. Okay. Their uh, mandatory redeemable preferred stock. What's that? In this case, I don't know because that's an awfully small number. Uh-huh. Uh, so I really don't know if that had something to do with something that happened because of debt they took on. Yeah, I don't but know. That's interesting. It, it is unusually small. Uh, anyways, uh, debt facilities, $176 million. Yeah. So what we do with that is I would compare it to the receivables. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So when we say receivables, that's their loan book, right? The financial So their finance receivables net. So that means that they've marked it down already. So let's say that they made um, $600 million in loans or something. They might immediately mark down, a company like this really could, mark down $150 million that they won't collect, they think. Mm-hmm. So then they have what they think they're going to collect on on their finance receivables. And that will be that number there that you see, $450 million. So what I would compare here for a company doing this sort of thing is the receivables, which is the amount that their customers a promise to pay them less what America's Car Mart thinks is not going to get paid back to them versus the amount of debt that they're using because in my mind that debt is really being backed it's really secured in, in all sorts of ways even whether legally it is secured or not by it um, by those receivables that you have so it's the relationship between those two numbers mm-hmm. so in this case we can see that it's somewhat um, over 30% actually it's clo- I don't know if it's 40% or something do you have a calculator there that can figure that out uh, so because we can just triple 176 see that it exceeds 450 so 176 divided by 450 uh, so I can do this. Yep. 39%. Okay. So they're using 40%. Mm-hmm. Um, they're borrowing 40% out of the 100% that y- you theoretically could borrow. I don't know that any bank would do that um, of your receivables. So that's sort of what they're using up. If you think about it the way that you might have a mortgage on a house or something, borrowing a loan to value is 40%. So their loan versus their finance receivables there is 40%. Now there might be other uh, debt things that they have. There's there's not a lot. Mm-hmm. No. no. Um, so that's really what they're doing. I think that's not too aggressive. I think it could be they could be fine in the 25 to 50% range. It wouldn't bother me. Mm-hmm. If they got up to 65 or something and there are some competitors that do more than that, I'd start to get worried probably at about a third. I also would be thinking a lot about how 
accurate um, America's car market is in that finance receivables number. Do I think that net number that they're showing, their provision for losses, the contra asset account there, mm-hmm. is accurate? Because theirs is more subprime type stuff, isn't it? It's deeply subprime. Yeah. America's mm-hmm. car market. Yeah. yeah. So um, that, those would be my concerns. I think the amount of debt they have with it isn't bad. Uh, but I'd be focused on like historically have they been pretty accurate about their finance receivables, what the provision for losses should be, so and versus like charge offs and stuff. Mm-hmm. So if they're normally provisioning twenty five percent, right, is the charge off rate normally been twenty five percent in the past? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, mm-hmm. got it. Uh, next company we could go over is a company that uh, we've spoken about a few times on this podcast, uh, Sydney Airport, mm-hmm. and. What's the debt to EBITDA on this? It's, it's, it's very like enormous, high. So like what 8%, I want, uh, yeah. So eight, what I want times. to talk about with Sydney Airport, why I want to pick this one is the importance of how, how you space out your debt. And so this one, capital management, this slide I think is the one that's really helpful this mm-hmm. way. So Sydney Airport has a very valuable asset. They have it was a ninety nine year lease. I don't know how much is left on it. Pretty long. Um, yeah, it's like runs on twenty ninety. Uh, but no. Yeah, it's it's nearly a hundred year lease. Mm-hmm. Um, so they have all nine. They have way over ninety years left on their lease on the airport there. And that that you bid us six point six times. Right. So how would I look? So if you see, people would say, well, look, what was Entercom's? Why would I be worried about Entercom mm-hmm. at whatever net debt to EBITDA they have? And yet Sydney Airport, I don't seem that concerned about the fact they have six to seven times, let's say, let's round that up, seven times mm-hmm. net debt to EBITDA. Why aren't I that concerned? Um, one, I just, the durability of an airport, I think, is greater than the durability of terrestrial radio. Sure, you get foot traffic and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Two, um, in essence, they have a very valuable asset because they have a lease on the airport for a very long time, which is very much the same as if you actually just owned the airport, mm-hmm. um, you know, in sort of a DCF perspective. Here they include the credit rating. Um, uh, so you can see how they're rated. Um, and it is... BBB plus. Yeah, MBA1. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if they're targeting using a lot of debt always. They also, we have some information uh, from this company in the past about how much debt they originally had and stuff. Mm. I don't, this company's never going to have no debt. Yeah, of course. Uh, I think they're always going to target like being a very poor investment grade credit or something like that would mm-hmm. be my guess. Um, but the things that I care about here are really the stuff like the average maturity, right? So the average maturity says that it's in mid 2025. Is that yep. what it says? Okay, yep. right. And then the other thing is that we actually have a debt maturity profile down here that shows us by year how much is coming due in each year. So the issue there is how much you have to refinance. And my concern normally with a company, a stock, where I don't feel that there's an actual risk of bankruptcy, is that I'm still concerned about issuing stock or something like that. So I would worry that your stock is going to plunge at the same time that you're going to people know that you have financing problems, mm-hmm. right? So if you have a stock that trades normally at you know 30 times earnings or something, and I own it, and then it drops because they're concerned about not being able to refinance something, and suddenly it's at 10 times earnings, the company might have to issue stock to raise money. It might have to give warrants to someone. It might have to use debt that's convertible into stock, things like that to entice someone to um, give them money mm-hmm. in a time, like say a financial crisis or something, right? So my concern is basically diluting at a bad stock price. Sure. And so what I want to have is a very even uh, amount of debt year after year and always a fairly long time out on average before I have to pay most of the debt. That part's compared to what I would like to see short for Sydney Airport. So Sydney Airport is only out, uh, the the maturity is only out like five years yeah. from here. Mm-hmm. The um, average maturity. Yeah, well, with an asset that's like a 100-year asset or whatever, um, you know, I, I would like that to be a lot longer. A, a long time ago, people, uh, companies used to use, you know, bonds that were a lot longer. Um, and I don't see big disadvantages to doing that. But uh, other than that, I like the way they space it out and all of those. I, you know, do I wish it was the average of 10 years out instead of five years? Yes. Uh, but... Otherwise, I like the things that I'm seeing there. And this is a really good example of how if you're going to carry this much debt, everything else about the company, I like what they're doing. I was going to say, I mean, there's other stuff too, right? They have price increases. They get a ton of foot traffic. There's, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, everyone's been in an airport, you know, sure, it's how, an asset how that, that is. can take yeah. a lot of leverage. If you're going Definitely. to put a lot of leverage on something, an airport, airport would, be, yeah. would be the logical one. I'm just saying that if you have... Um, 90 years left on your lease or more than 90 yeah, years. Yeah, why is the average? I wish that you weren't, because it's slightly cheaper to do it that way. Mm-hmm. And it was probably at the time they did some of the debt a lot cheaper, depending on the, like, the yield curve and stuff. So um, that's why a lot of these companies do it, because you report somewhat better earnings all the time by taking the risk of being that this stuff is maturing five years or less, half of it, rather than this stuff is maturing 10 years or less. Um, it's a trade-off that you have to take. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they would say that 10 years would be like overly conservative, no point in doing it. 
I don't know. I, I wouldn't mind seeing it. Mm-hmm. But I like everything else about the way they space it out. They also do a nice thing where they borrow in their own currency, Australian dollars, even when they borrow in other countries. And so, and they spread it out too so that they're not tapping any one market for a ton of um, the debt. So they have some stuff in the EU, they have some stuff in the US and Australia, and yet they're not like borrowing and having to hedge and stuff. So I like just about everything they do about how they handle their debt. Um, I don't love that their debt is six to seven times EBITDA, but you know, that's just something that, if you are going to be 67 times EBITDA, this is the best asset to put that amount of debt on. And the way they did it is the way that I would like. So that's a big difference between this and Entercom, let's say. No, but Entercom has pretty far out for its maturities, if I remember right. But the other aspects of it are more worrying for me. Got it. And then we're going to be going over the last company today, okay. Amar Precious Metals, which was also written up on the website, yes. focuscompounding.com. And we can go over there, um, you know, their liability side and look at, they have a ton. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to look at this one because it's sort of a very... All right. The last stock that we are going to be talking about today, Amar Precious Metals, another stock that was written up on the Focus Compounding website by Mr. Jeff Gannon, Amar Precious Metals. Thoughts on the company? We could go over uh, the liabilities right here. They have a lot of debt. Yeah. So I wanted to do this one because it's sort of a very simple kind of way of looking at something that's like an investment bank, right? Okay. So what they do is they um, sort of make markets, buy and sell physical gold and silver on behalf of some clients. They hold some things to and make loans against it um, that way to holding collateral. Uh, as a result, their current liabilities are going to be different. So let's just read over like some of the different things that they have, right? So they have a lot more in lines of credit. Yeah, right? lines of credit, two hundred four million liabilities on borrowed metals, right. one hundred ninety six million liabilities on. I'm sorry, product financing, financing arrangements, yeah. one hundred fifty nine million. They have the the uh, derivatives, right? They have some things like that, um, and then they also have like a, a notes a notes payable, yeah. right? But that kind of stuff, the notes payable thing, is more of a normal thing that people would expect. What you wouldn't expect so much is the lines of credit and and the liabilities on borrowed metals and the product financing arrangements, which are all very short term, probably sorts of things of everyday kind of business. So let's just add some of them up. So we have the total balance sheet here is eight hundred twenty seven million. That's including goodwill and stuff like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, um, those three items together are. Uh, uh, let's see. That's um, about. It's like five hundred sixty million. Yeah, I'd say five hundred sixty million ish. Yeah. So you've got something that's whatever that is, two thirds or something of the entire balance sheet is in this very short term sort of um, uh, liabilities, which are day to day sorts of things, which is what you'd expect from a, a uh, investment bank sort of thing, right? So let's go up to look at what ha- offsets that in terms of the sort of. Um, current assets right so the more current your assets not are, a net net no <laughs> so the more current your assets are um the more that that would be expected to be um uh securing things right and like a very interesting item here i think is restricted inventories right so that's giving you a guess as to what this company does and stuff most companies don't have any sort of restrictions on inventories but they do they have precious metals held under financing arrangements which i don't know all the details of that but that could be like repo type stuff and things like that they have secured loans receivable they have the derivative assets that we see and then you just have your cash receivables net the thing that's really interesting is after the cash receivables net are the other items which are things like the secured loans receivable the precious metals held under financing arrangements and the inventories right Mm -hmm. so when you look at those that's about the problem is that it's only about 300 what 372 million or Mm -hmm. something is all the the current assets yeah right whereas when we look at the current liabilities they're a lot bigger than that well you have some income tax receivable and stuff so it's actually but yeah it's it's like see income okay total current assets 783 million okay so you have 783 million but that's because of the invent the restricted inventories right Mm -hmm. yeah so they've broken up into three sections right so you have the with the inventories that you have there they have enough that it's covering their uh current liabilities right in fact they have a little excess um but without that they don't so you're seeing that a lot of these things that they have you can match off against stuff so if we learn more about the business and i wrote it up and stuff so we know a little bit more you can see things like okay precious metals held under financing arrangements what's that number um, 200 yeah right there 200 million right and then we got under product financing arrangements how much is that 159 million right mm-hmm. yeah so you can see that all right so it's less than the liability on it is less than what they're carrying the precious metals held under it at but not a lot less right so that's uh 80 or something like so they're doing like an 80 percent loan to value ratio or something you could look at it that way but there are other items there like in terms of inventory so they have um liabilities on borrowed metals right is like uh 200 million or something 
um, and lines of credit are like 200 million. So that's like 400 million right there. We could add up all the different inventories and things like that. We get a number of what their inventories are 370 million. So they have some other things. They have a little cash. They're basically offsetting. They have some receivables. They're basically offsetting. What you see with this balance sheet over and over again is that they don't really actually have a lot of net cash or net debt in any way. Um, they have a note payable and stuff that we'll look at at the bottom. But what they have is a lot of offsetting things that are probably very day to day things and a big risk with something like this or an investment bank or something is a balance sheet remember is prepared as of a certain day mm -hmm. so if we looked at it a week before a week after whatever it could look very different and, sure and um this may not be representative of what it normally looks like so at least one thing we could do is look at um both columns and kind of average out and see if they're big jumps and things um, to get a more average idea of what a balance sheet might look like. And of course, if you're doing it over a full year, you can look at each of the quarters and get an idea. That's not perfect still, but it gives us more of an idea of the day-to-day -day sort of thing of a business than looking at it at just one uh, date. And mm -hmm. so you can look and see, like, are any of these items really dramatically different by comparing what it was and a year ago? And some are. So like here, look at derivative assets. Mm -hmm. Now you can have accounting changes and things that cause that. But the other possibility is that sometimes they're doing a lot with derivatives business, sometimes a lot less. That's, you know, a lot more. Yeah, look at it. Last year have. it was 2.4 million. Right. Now so you'd want to look at like, okay, has there been an accounting change with the, how they handle the derivatives? Or do they sometimes use derivatives a lot and mostly not or something like that, you know? Um, so that's an accounting change, the operating lease right of use assets. We know that because we just happen to know what accounting changes happened in the last year. But for other things, they're not. A lot of the items, though, look the, the lines look pretty similar from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. They're not dramatically different. And so that's okay. Some of them don't, though, like the product financing arrangements. That's a hint that that might be unusual, I would say, right? That jumped over 50% or something, 60% more than that in one year. Now, their overall balance sheet, look, compare that. How much did the balance sheet jump? It jumped like more like 15% or something. So you have like a 60% jump in terms of um, one line there in a balance sheet that only jumped like 15% or something. You just focus in on those and go, okay, why did that happen? And did something big happen with how they uh, do their product financing arrangements? Or is it just a very volatile number? And if I was in the business hearing about it every week, I'd get very different amounts of these product financing mm -hmm. arrangements. And that's possibly what it is. What is something that would make you comfortable? I guess when you're looking at a balance sheet, what is it that makes you comfortable enough to, you know, pursue on and, you know, learn about the company more and, you know, just continue on in the investing process? Um, like what's something, maybe the easier question is what would just scare you away right away? Is it looking at something, um, like intercom communications? Yeah. So intercom communications has a ton of debt. It's not debt that's due very soon, but it's a ton of debt and has relatively little cash on hand. And then it's just like the overall business that's in itself. Well, that's what it's all the be, difference right? for intercom is the yeah. business. Mm -hmm. So it's a ton of debt without a lot of cash. So it all is about the free cash flows that you're expecting in future years. So all that's what creditors are counting on. And that's what you as a shareholder would be counting on. You have to be asking yourself pretty far out, I'd say, with a company like that uh, because of how much debt they have, how able they are going to be able to refinance to pay things down the debt over time from the cash flows from the radio station. So you very much focus immediately on that. Why I said I would pass on that one is I just, for that business, don't have as much confidence in it. Whereas if you showed me Sydney Airport, I'd say, okay, well, an airport, I feel like I can predict out 10 years. Radio stations, I don't feel like I can predict out five or 10 years. So since they have a lot of debt, not a lot of cash on hand, I'm going to need to know what that free cash flow is for years to come to know if they can pay that debt. So then it really comes down to the actual business, the prospects of it, the durability, the predictability, what it could look like in 10 years, and then that in relation to the actual debt that they're holding. You know, right. because like, right. for example, Sydney Airport, you're okay with them holding seven times mm -hmm. debt because of the nature of the business that they're in. Yeah. And, and, and then you have companies that are involved more in finance type things like CarMart and like uh, Amark Precious Metals. And then in those cases, it's more about do they have offsetting um, – uh, liquid assets that more than cover what they need. So in the case of CarMart, for instance, I'd feel pretty safe as long as I knew that they weren't doing ridiculous things in terms of how much they were saying they're eventually going to collect on the loans, that their receivables are so far in excess. So we could look at how much receivables cover it. So if like we said that was 40%, right? Yeah. So if you think about 40% means that it's two and a half times covered. I have it pulled up. So, uh, okay. So it's two and a half times covered. So there could be a pretty big decline 
in uh, their finance receivables. They could be wrong by a pretty big amount and still they're going to be able to cover the amount of debt that they have on it, right? So it's more like looking at it and saying, historically, do I trust the management and their estimates about receivables and stuff? And am I not seeing dramatic increases in debt versus the receivables? I would calculate for every single year for a company like this, what is debt as a percent of receivables? Mm -hmm. And consider like a regular thing that they're always doing, a leverage in the business, almost the way you would look at leverage used by banks and insurers and things like that. This is a finance company. And same thing with the AMR Precious metals i'd said it's kind of like an investment bank i would look at things like that like what is the loan to value of certain things that they have what's inventory relative to what they're um borrowing stuff like that because remember they're physical they have inventory that's like physical gold and mm -hmm. silver as long as you can sell that pretty quickly in the market if you have to like have a basically a margin call then you're pretty safe and so it's the extreme solvency that they have the short-term assets they have on hand the reason why that's not how it works at intercom or at sydney airport is they don't have a lot of cash receivables a lot of things that turn quickly into cash they don't have a lot of liquid assets so it's all about their future um, free cash flow cool well i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with jeff and myself on the number one value investing podcast in the world if this is the first time that you're tuning in with us make sure you follow along we have big plans for content in 2020 hit that subscribe button thumbs this video up leave us a rating and review um you know i just can't thank everybody enough for the support that we've received if you want to uh read our write-ups on focuscompounding.com sign up use the podcast promo code which is podcast and they'll take some money off of the subscription price and definitely if you want to see more interactive videos like this uh dm me some ideas we're always looking for new ideas of what we could do we may you know we've been kind of flirting with a bunch of different things um you know so we're always looking to get better and your input definitely matters i want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with us we'll see you next podcast take care Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk about actionable stock ideas, investing concepts, and the overall way that we think about investing at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Go to focuscompounding.com and enter in your email to get a free watch list from Jeff every other week. And be sure to check out all of our other work where Jeff writes about stocks at focuscompounding.com. I upload how-to investing videos on YouTube, and we both manage capital for investors at Focus Compounding Capital Management. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to follow along.